Uh, um, so how much is that? Well, welcome to the podcast editor's mastermind where your yetis try every couple of weeks to figure out how to actually live stream and record themselves. As professional editors, you'd think we have this nailed down, but if you could see behind the scenes, you'd realize it's always a mess off camera. So if you've joined us, we're glad that you're here. If you're catching the replay or catching the podcast, thanks for joining us that way. I'm Brian Entspringer. You'll find me at toptieraudio.com, and we'll go around to my right, and then I'll introduce our guest in just a second. I guess, Daniel, that's my left for you. <laughs> I'm Daniel Abendroth, and you can find me at rothmedia.audio. I'm Carrie Caulfield. Eric, you can find me at yayapodcasting.com. And our guest today is Virginia Elder. She's a podcast editor, but she does more than just editing. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because there's some stuff that she offers that I think are really key and could really help us add some serious value to our clients that I don't have a lot of experience with. Now, Virginia has over 15 years of experience in things like project management and client services, strategic organization, all kind of crazy stuff like that. But she's also really experienced with the idea of trying to juggle the content as well as the production process. And so what she is able to bring to her clients is sort of that streamlined, basically friction-free type podcast production experience. So Virginia, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. And when you say it all like that, it's just, it sounds wonderful. So thank you for the intro. Oh, you're, you're welcome. You know, it reads wonderful too. So just, <laughs> it's not, <laughs> okay. it's not just the, the beautiful voice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. So uh, for those that are joining us, we're going to be talking about adding services to podcast production and some of the things that Virginia does. But before we get into that, I thought it might be good just to get a little bit of understanding about how Virginia got into the business, what got her started, because I, I think that's a good journey for all of us to understand. So how did you get started online? Like what happened? <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I have a background, like you mentioned, um, podcast man or project management. And then um, at that time, I was working as an auditor, an internal auditor. So I was a good guy, don't worry. <laughs> and um, we personally were going through our own very crazy financial journey. So I got all into a bunch of financial podcasts and was a super avid listener. And um, it took us a while, but we straightened out our own situation and I'm super proud of it and happy. And there's so many people online sharing about their story and about their financial journey and how to get debt free and all of that. So I was gung ho about that. And I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a financial coach. I'm going to go out on my own, do my own business, coach people, help people get debt free. And I did. And I really enjoyed that. So that was, um, Gosh, you know, 2018 when I launched that initial website and launched my own podcast and blog posts and started doing all of that background content creation and just really trying to create that online business that everyone talks about, right? That everyone wants. And um, I started to sit there and, and feel frustrated that I was spending so much time creating content just for the abyss, right? That is the internet and hoping that people would come and read it. And I started thinking I could write for other people too, for like a little side money about financial stuff and just kind of started put it together. And so I took, um, an online course. Um, it was called earn more writing, very simple and plain and clear what you're going to do there. And I'm a big fan of online courses. I mean, that's, that's how I've learned everything I've learned. And when I launched my own podcast, I had people coming to me asking how I did that. And everything I offer now is from my own experience, writing and podcasting and, you know, figuring out audiograms and show notes and just all that for my own show. And then very quickly it snowballed into doing that for other people. So here we are. I feel like it's a bit of a jump, though, just directly from writing stuff for your financial blog to writing stuff for other people. Like, how how did that transition happen? 
Right. So initially I was focused on writing only articles about things that, of course, I was very familiar with. So it could be personal finances. It could have been something about kids or for moms or something very related to what I was comfortable with, right? And then in that financial space, you start to expand slowly, just like we all grow and change. Your knowledge grows and changes too. So then in time, you're interested in more other things. I wrote an article about dog treats with hemp in them one time because (laughs) I have dogs and I was like, sure, I'll research some hemp (laughs) stuff. Okay. (laughs) It's just, uh, you, there's a wealth of information out there. And if you're resourceful and you take advantage of it and you don't mind just doing a little bit of research, you can probably write about anything someone asks you to. Now, I will say it's important that you pick and choose, say no sometimes, and write about things that you feel comfortable with that are entertaining and interesting to you. So here's a question that I think a lot of people have is how did you get your first client? (laughs) So my first client was actually from Upwork. And (laughs) yeah, been there. Yeah. And I just because I listen to the show, sometimes I kind of knew a little bit about y'all's story too. But very similarly, I was sitting there thinking, gosh, this is so much work producing my own show, all this time editing and all this. I could do this for someone else, make a little extra side money. Let me find somebody, found somebody on Upwork. And the the magic there was he was a financial advisor, which is totally my jam, my background, we meshed very, very well. He was a father. So a lot of kids stuff and personal growth um, through raising kids and all that was a lot of what he talked about along with money. So just the topics just really aligned. On top of that, he was someone who just wanted to get behind the mic and talk. He didn't want to do the website. He didn't want to do the show notes, the blog posts, all that. So he just wanted it to happen. And I was like, well, I'm you know, I've done this for myself. Like I was very honest with him. I was like, I can do that for you, but you do have to pay me. (laughs) And so we agreed on some rates and things like that for all the different pieces. And I just started doing it. And honestly, I owe it to him that he really helped my confidence because he was like, this is great. This is great. He was so happy with everything. So I was like, okay, I can do this for more people. Let me find somebody else. And um, just kind of took off from there. What was your first client after Upwork. How was that transition um, after that? I was sharing with Brian before we started recording. Um, I love going to conventions. So Podcast Movement, PodFest, uh, Podcast Movement's coming up. Are you going? Um, Yes. I'm super excited. I guess I'll see y'all there. Um, And then whoever else is in the chat, if y'all are coming too, that'll be awesome. I'd love to meet some more editors. Um, But being interested in the financial space, I attended FinCon, which is where I met Steve Stewart. So that was a fabulous connection, still is. He has taught me so much. And um, I got I, at least two clients from FinCon directly, like right away. When we were there, we hung out and they said, hey, by the way, when we're done with this, I'm going back home and I'm getting my podcast together and I'm sending it to you. I need your help. And I was like, Okay, that's it. They were like, they heard you were, you know, you did this work. You were a podcast editor. You did all this. Yeah. And the, just and the, being friends with them and not even from pre, like we met there and we walked around together and went to booths together. And we were just chatting and, and you weren't selling anything. Right? There was no mm-mm. pitch. Okay. No, because I was very like still just trying to figure out how to become unswamped with my own show and my own financial coaching side and all of that. And I was still trying to figure out, I didn't know I was going to become a podcast editor at that time. I was still very like, I'm a financial coach and yeah, I have my show and I know how to do this. And they were like, can you, I want you to do this like for me. Um, And there again, they were um, financial advisors as well. So it's just kind of funny. So I guess, Maybe that's a big clue, right? Like find something that you're interested in and maybe you don't have to attend conventions about it, but be in that crowd. So that way you get shows that are about topics that you like, that you like to listen to. Because that's that was a big line that I drew from the very beginning. I don't want to do shows 
that I'm not interested in. If I am not en- enjoying the content, I don't want to edit it. <laughs> I don't want to sit there and suffer. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing worse than like falling asleep while you're editing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that sounds bad, but that show that I don't want to do is totally somebody else's, um, you know, beautiful masterpiece in the waiting, right? It's, it's just not for me. Yeah. And they deserve to have somebody who is uh, going to be like loving with that content, right? Yeah. I'm just cracking up at the comments. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and Steve, um, Steve posted the link for FinCon where we met. So that's, that's pretty cool. Thank you, Steve. Uh, for people listening to the podcast, go to FinConExpo.com and you will find all the information you need there. I have mm-hmm. no doubt. Let's talk about the services you provide, right? So are you doing kind of like the whole shebang where I could just record an episode, give you the files and say, I want it published this day and go? Yes. And so with that being said... There are definitely some Zoom calls that happen up front, making sure we're on the same page and I understand expectations and that they understand expectations the other way. So we definitely have a lot of upfront getting to know each other, right? Um, And we talk through what do you need? Do you need show notes? Maybe you don't. Do you need a blog post that is an expanded version of the podcast episode. Do you need social media? Maybe you don't. So it's, I like to say it's kind of a la carte. Um, the editing and the podcast production and host management is like the primary thing that they're coming to me for. And then from there, hey, what else do you need help with? What else, you know, what other piece of the podcast um you know, production part stresses you out. Like, let me do that for you. And if pricing and everything's agreeable, then that's what I do. I'm kind of wondering how you approach that. Cause I know you're a systems person, but when you start doing a la carte or pick from the menu and build, choose your own adventure type production, that can create a lot of chaos in terms of how, like, <laughs> how, <laughs> let's just, how do you do it? <laughs> So um, I have always been a little bit type A and very crazy organized. So I actually keep a physical like manila file folder for every client. And I keep a lovely yellow pad next to me at all times. And I literally take notes on everything. Um, Aside from that, while we're talking, I'm typically in a Dropbox paper or a Google Doc and I'm writing down what services this person needs, what they're thinking about, what they may need in the future. And then I always have a written quote that goes out to them. Um, They agree to that and then a contract, right? So if at any point, you know, six weeks down the road, they send me their next season of episodes. And I'm like, whoop, I don't remember what I'm supposed to do for them. I can pull up any of that documentation and quickly say, okay, you know, show notes and audiograms and that's it. And they take care of whatever else. Um, And just really keep notes. I use Trello to help me with the pieces, right? Like when things are due and certain deadlines, Um, And I really, really do love when someone just says, here's my audio. I want these five things. I want them to drop every Tuesday at 5 a.m. Go. Because that gives me just such a sense of control over the, and I do have control issues, (laughs) over the production. And I I want them to sound their best. I'm 1,000% in their court trying to make them sound as professional and as awesome as possible. And I like to feel like I have control over that piece. So I don't know. that's, that's my crazy coming out. <laughs> and do you have other people that work with you or are you a one person show at this point? So far I am one and I am needing, and I will hire at least one or two contractors in August. I am, I am maxed out I'm to my breaking point. How many clients is that feeling this way? Um, okay, so that gets confusing because I have some that are um, copywriting only clients. And that's interesting how that came about. But then I have, I want to say, four editing clients. 
Um, and some of those there again, you get the a la carte thing. Some of them is just the editing piece and some of them it's show notes and host management and posting graphics and scheduling a newsletter. And there's a lot that goes into some of those. So I'm going to have, a, a lower threshold, I think right now yeah. until I get some contractors going and I'm really looking forward to that. So what kind of contractors are you going to be hiring? Do you think? I want, and I guess this is good that editors, I think, listen to this show. I would love to have a junior editor um, that can handle just some very basic edits. And then I want a copywriter specific for help with a lot of the writing, um, whether that be blog posts or show notes. I think if I get one of each of those, that will give me a good start to start to feel okay, you know, do I need some another one of one of these? And which one do I need more of? And I think that'll be a good start. And how much do you think that'll expand your ability to take on new clients? Like how many, what would your client load increase to, do you think? Um, so that's where I've really been trying to think about exactly that. I'm not sure because sometimes you get a contractor that they can only work so many hours a week, right? So if I could find someone, and I, I don't think I'm ready to have someone full time. I think I need to be one of the people that they work for, right? So I would like to start with delegating out like one or two shows, you know, reviewing those edits, making sure they're to my standard. Same thing with the copywriting, making sure that I'm getting a blog post back that needs minimal um, rewrites or edits. And and moving on from there. But with podcast movement coming up, and of course you you do tend to hope that you get a client from some of these events, yeah. right? So I'm I'm kind of on that fence where I'm a little nervous. Like I definitely want the more more business, more clients, but I'm like, I need to hire somebody. So I'm a little uh, what do you say, like tentative, I guess, about that. So there's always those growing pains in business, no matter what it is, whether you need to take a course to learn something new or you need to hire. I just feel that's always going to be there. And that's a good thing. It is. But, you know, I'm tired of growing sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get to that point. <laughs> Where's When is it? Do you, you know, when do you get to actually take like a vacation? Where <laughs> Right. Or they're like, because now I take vacations now to learn new things. Um which I I, I, I want to grow up and be like you. Oh God, don't be like me. No, I'm nobody's role model. Uh, that's what my husband used to tell my son. But uh, we have some questions, Daniel. Do you want to? Uh, awesome. Um, yeah. So, do your clients generally? So this is from BG. Uh, do your clients generally have their own graphic designer for podcast cover art, etc.? Or did you learn to do that too? So I'm very upfront with people. If they want something fancy, they do need to find an actual graphic designer. But if they are very, you know, wanting just some simple, like here's the background and some words on it and they put their picture on there, I can do that. I have Canva Pro and um, I tend to be really meticulous about that stuff. So I don't want to necessarily do that too often because I'll spend too much time, right? <laughs> but I can do some basic, graphics for them but like I said that's all about being upfront with your client and you know what kind of graphic are you looking for here give me some examples and then I'll see what I can do do you ever struggle with scope creep I don't I'm sure it exists but I think a lot of times it's me spending too much time on the thing that I want to do like too much of a perfectionist um over the years, and I think this is just from, from being in corporate, I'm quick to say, hey, that wasn't part of the original deal. Like, maybe I'll do something one time for somebody and, and be very clear, like, hey, this wasn't included, but I did it this one time for you, but that's it. Next time, it's going to be such and such amount. Or, you know, I try to be really clear and honest about that stuff because, I don't want to be resentful. Like I don't, <laughs> I, I didn't do this so that I could be like sitting in my home office angry. Right. I did this for freedom and for happiness and so that I could control the workload and things like that. Yeah. Like hearing you say like 
being upfront honest, like I can do that and like setting limitations, like that's something we do. But it's also like how, learning how to say no. Mm -hmm. Or there's something like I can do that, but I don't want to. Mm -hmm. And it's like having that urge that people please are kind of like just doing it to make them happy. Yeah. But then it ended up being resentful whenever to do it week after week. And I think that's a personality thing, too. Um, I've had enough people not like me that I don't care anymore. Now I want to be you when I grow up. I grow up. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I do care. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, I've definitely had those, you know, evenings where you practically feel depressed because you're like, I think I really made this person mad and I didn't mean to or something, right? Like, that does happen. But honestly, if someone is going to have their expectations be that I do more than what they're paying for. I'm not here for that. Like, mm -mm, that is no, kind of a crazy, crazy expectation. expectation. <laughs> when you say it, <laughs> out, say loud, it out loud, it doesn't it sound right. right. Uh, <laughs> you put it like that. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> well, in um, some of that, um, Typically, like say, for example, for a new client um, launching a podcast episode, we're going to have at least two Zoom calls where we are talking about their vision for the show, what they want things to look like, what should happen a year from now, where this is going, why they're creating a podcast. Like we're going to talk about all the things so that I know what their goals are with the show. And in that conversation, I'm able to say, okay, I can do this. I will not do that. How much do you want, um, you know, like how many words are you thinking for your blog post? And I'll start to really get some ideas about what they want so that if they ever come back and say, oh, well, today I want a 3,000 word blog post. I'm like, mm, no, we were talking about 1,500 before. So this one's going to be more expensive. And it's just when you have all those conversations up front and you're taking notes and putting pieces of that in the proposal or in the contract, you have a very clear line. And if that line exists, I have no problem sticking to it. Now, if there was a questionable issue, that's where I might say, okay, I'll do this this one time because you didn't know. But after this, it's going to be this much money. And if they want it done, they're like, Okay, great. Happy to pay that. And if not, then they're like, oh, sorry, I won't do that again. I'm like, okay, cool. They're on the same page then. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. So Kareem has a question. Yeah, he has the same question that I have, which is, if you're a podcast editor, how do you expand to, to copywriting? Like, I'm a one or two paragraphs and bullet points kind of guy. Uh, how do I get to what you do? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think the first and most easy transition is going to be offering show notes, transcription, um, things that are very podcast related, um, maybe even some social media content post pieces like the words of your social media posts about the podcast, about the content that you just edited and listened to. Um, that would be the easiest baby step toward copywriting. From there, um, you can offer an expanded version of show notes or the transcription where you're fixing it up, you're putting headers and subheaders, and you're making it into paragraphs that are a lot more separate from, like someone wouldn't have to listen to the audio to understand what's going on. It's just a standalone piece of content. And when you're able to kind of expand in that direction and offer that blog post, there you go. You are a content copywriter of blog posts. So how much uh, SEO do you need to know in order to do this? SEO can be, that. that's fabulous. I thank you. That's awesome, Carrie. Um, SEO can be as complicated or as simple as you want it to be. Um, SEO can be, you type in Google a few of the words that you think might be related to this podcast episode and you look at the suggestions, like what else are people searching for? What are the suggested little questions and keywords that come up? Um, there's also, uh, now I have to look at it, but there is a keyword, like a free, um, it's called keywords everywhere. 
and it's a free browser add-on. And when you search for something, it comes up with a certain number of keywords off to the side of your search. And right there, that shows you, you know, f several keywords that relate to the topic that you just searched on. So basically, it's just playing around with Google. You can do the same thing in your podcast app and search for like a podcast episode on a topic that you want to listen to. And then look at those titles. Look at the other words that are showing up based on your search. Those are your keywords. So you can start to think about what's a question that someone would type in looking for this answer, kind of, you know, back into it in a way. And if you can work that question into a title or a subtitle or even just in the paragraph somewhere, you have done SEO. Um, and then you can even provide some of those little keywords to your client and they can post them inside of WordPress or whichever host they're using as keywords for that blog post. So they can go that extra step. Did that help or did that? Oh, totally no, oh, just that's help? just I feel like you just explained SEO to me after like, you know, <laughs> decades of having no clue what it what it was about. Like, I understand it in such a deeper way. And that was I mean, that was just amazing. amazing. You know what I would love to do? one day and this is I'm stealing this idea from one of my clients who does this for his show which is kind of similar to ours but in a different niche um, is to kind of have you do uh, an assessment of somebody's copywriting on like their sales page or something like have that as a live you know episode I think would be really cool so I, I would I, love to have you back for that. And if I would love to have somebody who's willing to be the victim because I don't want to do it. Um, um, <laughs> well, if you want something with plenty of room for improvement, just do the show notes that I write for this show and we'll, well call it. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's the other option. But it would be cool to have somebody like get that kind of advice you know, and be in the hot seat just because it's such a valuable yeah. tool. Yeah. Um, so we'll have to do that. I'm, I'm totally stealing that idea. Um, that sounds good. Well, and I just did some web copy for, um, she's a, like a health person. She helps with, um, pre-diabetes and, and things like that. And her website was very much like, Hey, you want to get your blood sugar under control? But I asked her, like, hey, do people come to you because they know they have a blood sugar issue or are they coming to you because they just got a problem and they don't know what's going on in their bodies? And that was the answer. Oh, so yeah. I completely flipped it around and was talking, um, talking, using her web copy and creating it more of, you know, that there's weight struggles, there's um, – like different moments of like shakiness versus extreme exhaustion and you know it depends on what you eat and it, it just going into the detail and I, there again I did research I asked her a ton of questions because I love health stuff but I don't know it all to the point where she does so it's it's often about what that person is looking for and how you could make them stumble upon you with whether that be your web copy or a blog post or even show notes, because there is SEO with show notes. Um, I wanted to say somebody I've learned a ton from. Um, okay, so Carrie, I've taken your RX course. It really, really helped me. <laughs> I didn't know anything about RX or, um, you know, any kind of audio processing before that. So that was awesome. I took Steve Stewart's Audacity course. And then for anything like blog posts, show notes, content stuff online, I follow a fellow named Pete McPherson, and he has a podcast. It's called Do You Even Blog? And he's all into the – and I met him at FinCon as well. Um, so if you are like, well, how do I write YouTube descriptions or how do I write blog posts or show – he has templates that you can download – he has all kinds of online courses. Everything that I've learned and that I do for people is from some sort of online course or someone's work that I looked at or some download thing or, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of online learning. 
Oh, I totally am. And I'm a big fan of everybody buying my course. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a I'm fan kidding. of online learning, but that Pete McPherson website, do you even blog? It looks like like a MySpace page. Is that a, <laughs> his, his writing's better than that, right? He's the funniest, quirkiest guy. Like he he's weird and he likes it that way. Like I got that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I want to say that this, the copywriter on my client show actually mentioned this website. So <laughs> mm-hmm. that's awesome. Yeah. And you could just watch like a couple of his YouTube channels, like, or I mean, YouTube episodes, uh, all kinds of topics and all that. Watching one right now. Uh, oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> We're recording. And then you can get a sense of his quirkiness. And so he... That helps me too, because the more that I watch someone like that who's so cool and quirky, it makes me really realize that I can just be myself and I don't have to be so stiff. I think um, from years and being in the corporate world, I was very stiff. I was very, the background has to be perfect and this has to be perfect and you have to look a certain way. And I watch somebody like him and I'm like, this is cool. This is what I want. So... If you if you have um, those like I guess imposter syndromes or whatever, which I'm still working through, anyways. But uh, so this brings me to an interesting question that I'm always curious about as somebody in business who is completely not corporate. I don't come from that space at, at all, really. Is how much of that quirky personality do you have with your clients, like? Are you like super profesh or are you like completely because I work with corporate clients, too. And actually, I work with um, kind of do some white labeling. And I feel like the company doesn't want me to talk to the corporate <laughs> clients at all <laughs> because I'm so like, like, I don't I don't care um, very mm-hmm. much if you don't. You know, I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but I do good work. Um, so how much of your personality are you displaying to your clients? I guess that's my question. So I think the answer to that is it depends. Um, if it is a corporate client and it is a very, you know, stiff kind of show, it has to be so professional. Well, then I'm going to kind of mirror that back to them. And then if it's someone that I met at FinCon and we're kind of friends and we had lunch together and we hung out and, you know, spent a week together in, in, you know, Florida or California or wherever we were, I feel really comfortable with that person. So I don't mind responding to an email in a much more conversational tone, right? Um, In addition, if it's someone that you know is your Facebook friend or is on Instagram following you and commenting back and forth, I feel like we're friends and I feel like I can be who would I want, you know, who I want to be to that person and be really truthful and and real, I guess. Um, Through, like I said, when I'm onboarding a client initially, we're going to have those couple of Zoom calls. We're going to really get to know each other. And so they are going to see me. They are going to see my home office and my kid might walk in and they're going to know that I'm a mom and my background and that I work from home and, I try to be very upfront about who I am and what they're going to get. And if they don't want to talk to me and, you know, I'm not their cup of tea, cool. But I could still do good work, right? Like you said, you do great work. You don't have to be best friends. Yeah, exactly. I don't I don't know if anybody else is this. It's just something I've been thinking about for a while is like how much, especially with social media and everything is like we're on display. So... Yeah. You know, how does that show up in businesses? Always I feel like if happening. if you hold back, you're just, you know, withholding from yourself. You know, you're just holding that piece inside of you and it that's going to get toxic for you. Right. So if you're not their cup of tea, that's fine. Like we don't need to be best friends, but I can still work for you and you can still pay me well and I can still give you a great product. Like we, that's fine. Yeah. You don't have to be best friends. Um, and I don't think you should hide who you are. I mean, 
So what? Like, be the cat lady, be the quirky, like, whatever, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I've tried. Uh, no, but I, and, you know, I don't know if this is one of my other new existential crises or not, so I'll stop here. But, I, you know, it's just something I've been thinking about for a long time. It's, uh, uh, all right. Somebody else asked a question. Let's not look at me anymore. How about Daniel? I think it's Daniel's turn. Well, I just want to add that, you know, we do this because, like, we enjoy it and we enjoy the lifestyle and, like, mm-hmm. creating what we want. And part of that is, like, being able to be yourself. And, like, if you are a quirky person, like, put your quirks out there and attract the kind of clients that want to work with somebody exactly. like that. Exactly. But hopefully they just have a big budget. But that's, you know. Ex- yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sign them up, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's where, like, you have the shows that you want to work on that are um, a passion topic of yours, right? So I like financial shows. Um, I also like a lot of motherhood shows. I love when motherhood and money combine. Like, and that's part of, you know, that financial coaching background. And But I'm also, like you said, if somebody – comes to me they have a big budget they want this super professional production maybe it's not my favorite topic but they're paying me well and we don't have to be best friends so (laughs) yeah Yeah. absolutely so have you ever had to fire a client because it wasn't a great fit yes (laughs) and now that we've got the yes no question out of the way can we hear that story (laughs) (laughs) yes (laughs) so um I do quite a bit of writing for an investment company and that person and I have a great relationship. We also met at FinCon and they have been wonderful about referring me to other clients and someone else needed some web copy work done and, you know, do the Zoom calls, meet up with them, um, do the work and the whole time was just like pulling teeth. I mean, it was awful. And I think it was awful for them too. Like I felt like every time we got on a call, like everyone was frustrated. And I was trying my hardest. Um, A lot of it was that they didn't really have an ideal client, an ideal like specific angle. Um, So it was very hard to write for them. And, And when you have Uh, I want to say problems, identifying your client avatar. I'm sure we've heard those terms. Um, Your copy is going to come out really general and really bland and basic. And I was struggling with that. And basically, I ended up just finishing the work. And they had asked me to, you know, can you add this? And can you do this? And there again, that scope creep. I was very firm about like, nope, that wasn't in the original deal. And eventually, I kind of fibbed and told him, actually, I'm really busy and I cannot take on more work. And I wasn't actually that busy at that time, but I just didn't want to do more work for them. And so I just finished the job, build them. And then they took forever to pay too. So I was like, Oh no, I am not doing more work (laughs) for you guys. Like, Nope. (laughs) So that was where I didn't necessarily have that conversation. Like we're done, but it was this very, um, firm decision on my end that I would finish the work as best as I could as fast as possible and get them out of my life. So, um, and not accept more work from them. (laughs) You have quite a variety of clients as far as like some get editing, some get this and like, how do you keep all that in order? Like, is it just Trello or do you have some other tips and tricks you can share with us? Uh, So far it is, Primarily Trello. Um, I have a copywriting board and I have a podcast editing and, you know, the podcast piece board. So that could have social media on it or it could have different pieces on there, but it's all related to podcasts. And then on the copywriting board, that's primarily blog posts and newsletters that don't really relate to podcasts. So, so far, that's what I use. Um, Most clients and I share a Google Sheet where they're populating ideas and blogs that they love that are on this topic that I can reference. I do want people to give me some content that they love on the topic that they want me to write about. So we're often sharing back and forth 
links and things that are in a spreadsheet that I can open each week when I know, hey, it's time to write this person's blog. There's a spreadsheet. Here's all the links for the references. And I can start doing an outline for the post. So far, it's just Trello. I am more than positive, especially with hiring contractors, that I will need something else. And there again, that's where I'm referring back to some of y'all's prior episodes to learn what your <laughs> management systems are and which ones I should go with. So um, I'm very open to just starting with what works or what I can do now and knowing that it's always going to change. Like by the time that I feel comfortable with something, I'm going to have to learn something new. And that's just how it is. So I think, yeah, Trello's worked so far. There's such great advice in there. I can't even like the having the client give you a reference to things that they already love, like writing they already love that I think that simplifies it. Um, so much and when I was doing because I did graphic design before I did editing that's what I and I would make cover art for podcasts right that's how I I kind of ventured in I didn't know that yeah so I'd ask them to go uh pick out other podcast cover art that they really liked and and that's where we started and that was super helpful so I can see like, I didn't think about that in any other context, though. Like, I didn't think that, I mean, that would work in writing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that's amazing. And it does, especially, you know, say you're going to offer show notes. Okay, well, there's a million ways you can offer show notes. There's, you know, so many ways. Some people have bullet points with timestamps, and some people have paragraphs, and some people basically it looks like a blog post kind of. Uh, there's so many different styles. So if someone will come to me with, hey, I like what this guy does – okay, we're going to emulate that. Um, and I do the same thing with uh, that question earlier was if I do graphic design and that's what I do. I tell them, well, find some podcast covers that you like and send them to me and I'll see if I can do that. <laughs> Canva is a godsend. Let me tell you, you can do it so is. much with it. And and I have those graphic design skills. Do I ever open Photoshop? And what I do, do I grow? No and yes. <laughs> well, it's the same, um, you know, Whatever someone wants you to do or whatever you're thinking about offering, look at some that you like. If you want audiograms made, find some that you like that you saw on social media and bring that to, to your editor and see if they can do that. And that's how we all grow, right? I can see it, what program they use or where it came from or if I've ever seen that type before, Um yeah, that's that's basically how I've done almost everything, even with web copy. Like, send me some of your maybe even competitors' websites that you think are awesome. And let's go from there. So, yeah, definitely don't recreate the wheel. Like, there's too many wheels already out there. Just look at those. If there's uh, a podcast editor or a podcast manager right now that's listening to this and they're going, hey, I might want to add this, but maybe they're thinking – I don't know if I've got what it takes. Is there like a, a baseline of you need to be able to do this in order to think about doing copywriting as a podcast manager, editor, whatever? Hmm. I think as far as written language, you have to be really comfortable with, with writing. And, and of course there's things out there like Grammarly and, you know, great programs. So even if you're not that great of a writer, what I would say is y you passed high school English, I hope. And so write, use Grammarly, do some spell check, and then read it to yourself out loud. Does it sound like something that you would actually say? Does it flow? Does it sound choppy or strange? But if you read something out loud, it's going to read well, usually. And I think that's one of the main steps that I even still take before I send off a blog post. I sit here at my computer and I read it out loud to myself just to make sure it doesn't sound robotic or, um, you know, too friendly or too informative or just, you know, just trying to feel it out and, and make sure it sounds proper. And do you like writing in the first place, Kareem? <laughs> <laughs> I I do. Um, and that's where with any of these services, there is somebody out there that it feels like murder, right? To like sit down and have to write. Those are the people 
who want you to write for them and who will pay you. And so if you're even slightly, (laughs) so if you're even slightly comfortable with spending an hour writing and you feel like you can make good progress in that hour and you come up with a good price that you're willing to charge for that hour of your work and just all the pieces fit together, sure, do it. Um, And I think that's a big key too, is like when you're offering these additional services, make sure you dinker around with it a little bit so that you know how long it takes you to write a thousand words and how long it takes you to proofread and how you're going to send it back to the client. I use Google Docs and so that they can pop in and they can make comments about, um, you know, whether it be corrections or, hey, can you reword this or, um, you know, can you lean towards this topic a little bit more or whatever. And so that's a good way to communicate without have to having like a Zoom call or sending videos back and forth or something like that. They can just make comments in the doc if there are revisions. So that's convenient. Yeah. And and if there's somebody like Daniel that's thinking, I don't want to do this, but I want to hire somebody like what should we do in terms of screening somebody's like, let's just say that I'm not a terribly good writer, but I want to hire a great writer for my clients, but I don't know, like, what, what do I ask? What do I look for? Yeah, I would definitely ask for links to other articles that they've written. Um, You could even do one test topic article and, you know, offer um, an amount that you feel comfortable with or see what their rate is. Give them some reference points. Have a conversation about your angle and what you want the article to encourage somebody or inform them or teach them, whatever it is. See how they do. If they don't do well, don't don't hire them. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> There's so many writers out there. I mean, I'm even testing for my own website. This isn't for client work, but for my own website. I know what podcast content and copywriting content I want on my website. So I did the same thing for people on Fiverr. And I'm testing out like five different writers to see how they do with the full expectation that you know, there's going to be some language barriers and I'm going to have to probably rewrite a lot of it. But if they're doing the meat of the content for me, for my site, that's going to be really helpful as far as my time. So I can continue to focus on clients. Well, when you find that person, can you share it with the rest, share them with the rest of us? Uh, (laughs) Right, right. So an idea that I had recently, since I do want to hire a copywriter um, for myself too, is there are courses out there that teach copywriting, right? And I'm sure there's Facebook groups attached to those courses because that's how everybody does it these days. So I've been really thinking about contacting the creator of that course, whether it be through social media or whatever, and say, hey, I'm looking for a copywriter. Would you like to provide this job posting to your students and see who is willing to apply? That way I know they've completed a legit copywriting course. And I would think that's helpful to all those students and that course creator that she's able to, or he, she or he is able to help their students get hired. So I was thinking about that. Yeah, that's a good idea. So I guess we're coming to the end of things here. We are. Oh. Yeah. Do you have <laughs> any more questions? I mean, yes. <laughs> like but. a billion, but we don't have time for yeah. them all. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I think that, like if I could leave people with anything, it's just like be resourceful. Um, don't be afraid to watch a YouTube video or take an online course or look at someone else's show notes and kind of mimic what they did. I mean, it doesn't have to be you sitting down at a blank sheet of paper with the cursor blinking at you. Like, you can mimic what someone else has done that you think they're doing a good job at and create it for yourself or your client. You don't have to recreate the will every time. So Gabriel has a question um, and he says, why start with a junior position instead of hiring somebody more senior? Hmm. I mean, I guess that's where I, I have to still sit down and figure out what exact tasks I want someone to do for me 
and what level of control I still want to maintain because I have problems with that. <laughs> I, I will say, just starting with somebody who's um, more junior, just being able to train them the way you want um, for me is really helpful. Like I like to start like young and, and, and in experience working with younger editors, like not younger but in age, but newer. I've been yeah. able to like get them to edit the way I want to. Um, and it, it's just turned out really well. Like we were able to grow together. Right. And no, but like they didn't have any preconceived ideas really. Um, right. Um, and that was really helpful. And I think that is what I'm kind of leaning towards. Like I'm not necessarily wanting someone to take this entire show and like here now it's your baby. I still want that to be my baby, but I want them to do the first pass and, um, you know, just kind of clean up the audio and take out the, you know, ums and ahs and all that and just help me out with some of that time. And then, yes, like you said, maybe they're wanting to take on more. So I'm, I'm still toying with what I want them to do. So, but y'all have a great prior episode that I was listening to that's all about this. So we can plug that. We don't know what episode. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was wait, wait, episode thirty-two episode? Oh. or thirty-three. It's about know. hiring contractors or VAs. Mm. I don't know. Anybody can pull the show up. I think it's thirty-one. Yeah. It'll be in the show notes for sure. Yeah, yeah, it will. Yeah, it's, it's with... an ongoing challenge for some of us. Me, maybe. <laughs> no, oh. episode thirty: How to find, hire, and manage a subcontractor. Nice. I think it's probably about time for us to go ahead and transition to our pod decks question of the day. We've got just a couple minutes left and this is, this is a real question. And just so that you don't think I'm playing favorites, I'm not sure that I have a good answer for this one yet. So I'm going to go ahead and ask it. What's the weirdest tradition that your family has? Now, for those of you that are watching live, leave your answers in the chat. We'd like to know about your weird family traditions. Carrie, I think that you said that you have one. I actually have two. Okay. Oh, Perfect. <laughs> You can have mine. Um, they're yeah. So and they're both involved driving, right? So whenever my family drives past a cow, we say hello to the cow and moo. We like also it. we also look to see if the cow is laying down or standing up because they're laying down. It usually means it's going to rain, and so they're they give us our weather report. And then when we go over railroad tracks or what we knew was once where rail railroad tracks, we lift up our feet. I have heard of that one. Yeah, you're yeah. supposed to make a wish, but at this point, we don't care. We just lift up. It just feels weird if you don't lift up your feet. <laughs> Funny. So mine, and I feel like Brienne Atwood is reading my mind, or there's something weird going on. But my wife and I, we did get every Christmas Eve, we get Chinese takeout and watch It's a Wonderful Life. That is our tradition. That's funny. That's funny. Oh, I'm trying to think. So I'm not sure that we have a weird tradition, but one of the things that we like to do when we're feeling really lazy is breakfast for dinner. Mm. That's uh, we, we like so to take good. things and move them to the wrong time of day, and that just makes it extra special. Mm, that's good. That's good. So kind of along that lines with food. So I don't. I don't know if this is a tradition either, but um, so this comes from back when we were super tight going through that financial journey that I mentioned at the very beginning. Um, and we were like, okay, we got $10. You want to go get burgers? Like, how, what are we going to do? So we would go through the drive through get like the bare bones burgers, right? Like just, you know, no cheese, like nothing that costs extra. Okay. And then bring it home and then put on like our own cheese, jalapenos, like whatever else is in the refrigerator and like make fancy burgers and like sit down. And we just really enjoyed that. And to this day, the kids are like, are we going to do our own cheese? <laughs> I great. love that idea though. That's awesome. Yeah. Stealing it. <laughs> It's super silly, but and I'm sure it saves you like 10 cents a burger or something. But um, if you think about it, like bacon and cheese and jalapeno, like all those add-ons, all of a sudden you're spending mm -hmm. way more than you, what you thought, but you have that in the refrigerator. So. And the bacon is so much better when it's like fresh at home and not like it's whatever like, they Not microwaved and it's you. sitting in a – under a heat lamp. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So whatever you got in the fridge and just make a fancy burger and it, it makes the night fun. I don't know. I like that <laughs> idea. That. Plus you don't have to cook the burger. Yeah. Okay. I am really bad. I do not make a good hamburger. 
Um, I'm just going to throw that out there. Do not eat my hamburgers. They are horrible. Yeah. That's, that's a good one. I might try that on my kids because they would go for that like yeah. nobody's business. It's like build your own. It's great. It's like making pizza at home. Yes. Right? <laughs> only, only. We do that too. We buy the cheapy pizzas. And then we like unwrap them and put on all these crazy toppings and spinach and broccoli and just all the kinds of stuff. And Elder Burger, Michael Cherry. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, so then we have gourmet pizza too. And it's just stuff out of the refrigerator. Because if you buy one of those pizzas, it's super expensive. Oh, yeah. I know. Like if I go to a pizza place and I want all the, my toppings I like, it's like a $40 pizza. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there we go. Money saving food takeout tips yeah this has so, been great we learned about copywriting and adding services and running a business and also making pizza i know well like it's, saving money on food right and time <laughs> yeah like i'm all about that because we're all busy editors right we're all like working for clients but we want to eat well so right. yeah <laughs> and hey like spinach on top of your pizza then it's like healthy right oh i love, spinach. Oh, I love that's, that's that's yeah and rule. basil too yeah you can get away yeah. with it that's funny so if somebody wants to be a guest on the show, Carrie, would you like to tell them what they can do to get their face right where Virginia's is right now? No. Okay, well, how about you, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just go to podcasteditorsmastermind.com slash be a guest, fill out the form, and eventually I'll get back to you once I check my spam for some reason. That's where it goes. <laughs> oh, no. we, we paid extra for that feature. Don't get us wrong. <laughs> well, this has been fun. For those of you that have joined us in the, the chat for the live stream, thank you. For those that caught it later, we're glad that you joined us as well. Um, we'll just kind of go around and do quick outro for each other. Virginia, when we get to you, you can tell everybody where to find you and all that stuff, and we'll say goodbye. So I'm Brian Ensminger. TopTierAudio.com is where you'll find me or social media at Top Tier Audio. We'll go around the other direction to Carrie. Oh. Carrie Caulfield. Eric, you can find me at yayapodcasting.com or on Instagram at Carrie Eric. I'm Daniel Abendroth. You can find me at rothmedia.audio. And if you're interested in Reaper information, go to reaperforpodcasting.com. And I'm Virginia Elder. Thanks for having me today, guys. You can find me at podcastabundance.com. And then I'm also at Podcast Abundance on Instagram and on Facebook. Oh, one quick question. If mm -hmm. somebody oh, yeah. wants to be one of your contractors or they're interested in talking to you about that, what do they do? Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, email me at Virginia at podcastabundance.com. Awesome. Thank you so and much. Of course, links to all that, and everything we talked about is going to be in the show notes at podcasteditorsmastermind.com. And there was a lot. So be sure yes. to check that out. <laughs> yeah. My fingers are still burning. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, Virginia, thank you for joining us. This has been truly great. And for everybody that joined us in the audience, thank you as well. Uh, um, so how much is that? Um, 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 um